Good morning. We are going to be looking at 1 Peter 1, chapter 13 through to chapter 2, verse 3, if you've got your Bibles to hand. But before we do so, let's just pray, shall we? Father, we ask that as we come to your breathed Word, that you would open our understanding, that you would speak to us by name, for Jesus' sake. We're going to be spending the next three Sundays looking at CBC's vision and values, essentially what it, we are about as believers and as a church. The vision statement is, our aim is to be a loving community of disciples of Jesus, following Him, growing in Him, and witnessing to Him through words, works, and wonders. And this morning we're looking at the first of these, loving God, the next one being loving one another, and the final one being loving the world. But these are inseparable because to love God is to love one another, is to love our world. But we're looking at loving God this morning from this passage. I'm not sure whether vision statements or mission statements are something you're familiar with, but when I was with ELC, we spent a lot of time discussing and formulating our mission statement because it essentially defined what we saw as the purpose of our business. It gave us an anchor point when planning for the future and it set the culture for our organization because we felt that it was essential that everyone within the business was able to buy into it. It set our trajectory. Let me give you a couple of other vision statements from major companies, to refresh the world, to inspire moments of optimism and happiness, to create value and make a difference. That's Coca-Cola. To bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And one of their founders, Bowerman, added, if you have a body... You're an athlete. I'll leave you to think on that one. But that was from Nike. But it's vital that the behavior of individuals within the organization reflects its vision statement. Otherwise, it's seen as being no more than words. United Airlines found that out to their cost when their statement was to make every flight a positive experience for our customers. But by 2017, they were embroiled in a customer-led crisis after they treated a passenger very badly and then fumbled the apology. This is what happens in the commercial world. But the stakes are so much higher for followers of Jesus because we want everything we do and say as individuals and as a church to mirror and make Christ known. So at risk of stating the glaringly obvious, if we hope and want to live out this vision statement, we're going to need to ask the help of the Holy Spirit daily, because without Him, we will just be going through the motions. One, to be a loving community. That means that we will be looking out for each other. Love is something we do not just talk about. That means we need to guard our lips. And can I suggest that we also guard our texts and our emails so that we affirm and we encourage that we don't involve in put-downs of people? Secondly, to follow Jesus, we come as we are, as is. But we won't stay that way. So thirdly, we grow in Him. We are called to grow. It's one of the evidences of being a Christian, that change within our desires, that we now want to live for Christ, not for ourselves, that we find a new hunger to know Him and to love Him even more. 
And when Peter was writing his second letter, in the first chapter he said, make every effort to add to your faith knowledge and self-control and perseverance and godliness and brotherly kindness and love. We are called to grow. And then finally, within this vision statement, to make Christ known by words, by works, by wonders. I love what John Wesley said. Do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, for all the people you can, as long as ever you can. And as we surrender more and more of our lives to Him, as individuals, as a, as a, as a body, as we open ourselves up to His Holy Spirit, so we will more effectively make Christ known. And as we come to this beautiful passage in 1 Peter, here is a call to action. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. The message puts it this way. So roll up your sleeves, put your mind in gear, be totally ready to receive the gift that's coming when Jesus arrives. We're told to live in the light of his return, to live, as it says in verse 17, as strangers, as, as foreigners, because this is not where we belong on a permanent basis. We are strangers, we are foreigners here. And the first word, therefore, in verse 13, links us back to the earlier part of this chapter where Peter outlines all that God has done for us in Christ. He has given us a living hope, new birth, a living hope, a risen Savior. We have an inheritance being kept for us, which can never spoil. We have a precious faith in a risen Christ whom we love. And he says, you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And it's against this backdrop of grace that we are called to action. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you. Set your hope. Verse 14 says, As obedient children, don't conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. The message puts it this way, don't lazily slip back into those old grooves of evil, doing just what you feel like doing. You know better now. See, this is what it means to be a Christian, to be a believer. We are a new creation, a new heart, a new start, a new master, a new destiny. The old has gone. The new has come. Grace means that God accepts and loves you as you are. But, oh, he has big plans for you. Good works which he prepared in advance for us to do. Grace is something our world simply cannot give. It is particular to the Christian faith. The world instead offers tolerance. But tolerance cannot and does not value people. It puts up with their beliefs and their behavior. Tolerance cannot offer justice or mercy. It can only look the other way. Tolerance can't embrace us if it knew our sin, and it certainly cannot remove guilt. But God far exceeds the requirements of mere tolerance. He forgives and He blesses the unworthy. Please take time out to, to, to read through Luke 15, verse 13, verses 13 to 24 about the prodigal, where God the Father blesses and embraces the unworthy. It says in Romans, God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled. How much more shall we be saved through his life? Those who sinned against God, those who were God's enemies, and yet he still drew us to himself. And if we as a church, as a body of believers, are going to make Jesus known, we're going to need to go way beyond tolerance. We're going to have to show grace to all. 
as we invite them to join us together as we explore the incredible love of God in Jesus. Do not let your past define you or shape you. As the Scriptures clearly say, if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has gone. Rosario in Argentina is a major agricultural port. It's where Lionel Messi comes from. But a city of 1.3 million people has high levels of poverty and crime with gangs fighting for control of the drug markets. And that means its prisoners are full. Jorg Agolanta was sentenced to 12 years in 2014 for killing someone. He became a Christian in prison and said that God's word had turned him into a new man. And every Saturday, he heads home for 24 hours to minister at a small evangelical church. He started at a garage in this city. The guards remove his handcuffs, then watch in silence, and I guess amazement, as this hitman turned pastor goes off to his church. He's got to be back the following day by a certain time to the cell block, to return to his cell block, known by the inmates as the church. And a lot of those prisoners have come to faith in Christ whilst behind bars. They fell into a spiral as teenagers of, of, of violence and drugs and found themselves in prison. But over the past 20 years, the Argentine prison authorities have encouraged the creation of units which are effectively run by evangelical inmates with helpers. They're safer and calmer than the regular units. And anyone who violates any of the rules of being in those units, i.e. fighting or smoking, alcohol or drugs, they get sent back to the, the normal prison. One pastor working there said, we bring peace to the prisons. There was never a riot inside the evangelical cell blocks, and that's better for the authorities. Each evangelical unit has about 190 inmates. It's run by 10 prisoners, and they have many helpers. And as one pastor said, we don't use knives to take over a cell block. We let the Bible do that. And while speaking at one of the meetings, the Reverend Sergio Pravda said to the 90 prisoners gathered there, put your old criminal lives behind you. That old man has to die. And as he heard those words, George Aguilanta closed his eyes and wept. Thankful for this wonderful new opportunity that God has given him. That old man has to die. Leave it where it belongs in the past. I don't know if you're anything like me, but Satan often tries to bring up things from my past and says, do you really think that that has been forgiven? It, it's become one of my favorite verses in a hymn when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. In his book, Totally Forgiving Yourselves, R.T. Kendall speaks of forgiveness. And I'm only going to mention three of the points, and I'd recommend, if you can, buy the book. It's a beautiful read, but it helped me enormously. He, he, he said, regarding your past, do not talk about your old failures or your old sins, even, not even to yourself. Why? Because it focuses on you. Let it go. Secondly, when fear comes in, when that fear of whatever comes in, your past, remember, if you've confessed it and you've turned from it, then Jesus has completely forgiven you. Embrace the forgiveness he's offered. Don't listen to lies. Read his word. Spend a bit of time in prayer or, or put on a really good TV program. I like that. That's nice and earthy. He says, but switch your mind from the focus on you and your past for things you've already confessed and turned away from. Because God has not given us the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. He said, Third, thirdly, don't accept any guilt about what you've already confessed. Remember this. It's now cleansed and covered by the precious 
blood of Christ. And there are more points to that book, but please, if you can avail yourselves of it, please do. But it helped me enormously. Leave your past what it is. Don't conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. No. Set your hope with minds that are alert. And then he says this, be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Motivations to holiness? Be holy as I am holy. With minds that are alert, what's the connection? Because holiness begins in our thought life. As someone once said, our thoughts become our words. Our words become our actions. Our actions become our habits. And our habits become our character. We become the choice or the choices that we make bit by bit. So it's imperative that we make good choices. We need to guard our hearts. We need to make sure that we're watching them because that's where the problems originate. Have a look at Proverbs 4.23. It talks about the heart, but also it means the mind. Murder and adultery and theft and violence, they originate in our thoughts. Be holy as I am holy. I love Nicky Gumbel's comment on this. He says, holiness does not mean being perfect. It means living a life of integrity. It's the opposite of sham, pretense. It means being honest. It means being real and authentic. And as we come to verses 17 to 21, we have a further motivation, an incredibly powerful one to holiness. Remember what it cost to redeem us. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ. The precious blood of Christ. Remember what it cost. In his book that I referred to before, Amazed by Jesus, Simon Ponsonby says this, the physical sufferings of our Lord were not the worst of it. Others regularly endured the same physicality of brutality at the hands of the Romans. 5,000 slaves who rebelled with Spartacus were crucified in 71 BC. But the greatest suffering, the utterly unique suffering, was that God made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. He became accursed for us by hanging on a tree. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. And what that meant was shouted from the cross when Jesus cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Remember what it cost. Everything. 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 And as we come to verses 22 and 23, now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you've sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. Love one another deeply from the heart. When John was writing his first letter, and he said, Beloved children, our love must be a way of life demonstrated through loving deeds. When the Lord Jesus spoke back in John 13, he said, By this will all men know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. Love one another deeply from the heart. Dariush was an Iranian he lived in a community in Iran where hatred for Israel was encouraged. Every morning before class, they would shout, Death to Israel! He subsequently entered the Iranian military and during that time became addicted to drugs. Life in Iran was difficult, so after serving in the military, he fled the country illegally. He landed in England, 
wanted to have a better life, but he didn't have a good reason for staying here. So he pretended to be a persecuted Christian from Iran. But he knew that he didn't know anything about Christianity, so he joined a church to find out about Jesus. And he learned, but it was all up here. The day for his interview came near and Dariush called his pastor for help. As they sat talking, the pastor turned to him and said, Dariush, stop living a lie. Stand in the truth. That really hit him. So one day he shut himself in his room and he got down on his knees and he cried out to God, if you're real, would you make yourself real to me? And God did. The Lord just overwhelmed him with love. And he said, the moment I gave my heart to him, he gave me the strength, he gave me the power to give up drugs. He put new desires and new strength within me. He said, I started a new life. He went back into the immigration office. He confessed his wrongdoing and was then summoned to court for lying to the government. But something miraculous happened within the court, in the courtroom. As the judge was questioning him, there used to say that he would explain his predicament or his situation, his new one, by looking at Psalm 96, sing to the Lord a new song, declare his glory, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Psalm 96. And the judge felt, since he was reading from it, that everybody in the courtroom should also get a Bible and look at Psalm 96. And so they did. They looked at Psalm 96 together in that courtroom. And another miracle happened when he was accepted and they said you could stay in England. Speaking about it, he says, I grew up acquiring hatred for Israel. But when I encountered Jesus Christ, that hatred turned to love. As I started to study the Bible, as I continued, I learned to love Israel. He said, his words, God gave me a passion, a love for the Jewish people, because the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jesus Christ, saved my life. Love, replacing hatred. You know, we can do all this stuff. Prophecies, fathom all mysteries, faith that can move mountains. We can give away everything we possess. We can even offer up our own bodies to hardship. But uh, without love, we are nothing. Without love, we gain nothing. And love is not instead of the gifts of the Spirit. It's the only foundation for the loving exercise of those gifts. Otherwise, they can alienate and divide which is exactly the opposite of what God intended. Love one another deeply from the heart. You see, real love sees, real love cares. It's action it, and in truth. And I know over the last 12 months, it's been difficult to see each other. It's been hard to meet with each other. But can I ask you, do you know somebody within your community or your, your house group or, or, or somebody that's having a hard time? Let me just ask you, what I ask myself, have you called them? If you've not been able to see them, have you called them? Have you spoken to them? Have you prayed for them or, or with them? Have you, where appropriate, sent them, say, flowers? Just what have you done that's gone beyond words? What have I done that goes beyond words and good intentions and that demonstrates God's love and compassion? And you see, what God asks of us is grounded very much in his word. For you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. His word that cleanses and renews and feeds us for a life of love. Because love and truth are inextricably linked. When Paul was writing to the Thessalonians, he said, there's no need for anyone to say much to you about loving your fellow believers. For God's continually teaching you to unselfishly love one another. Indeed, he said, your love is what you're known for throughout Macedonia. Can you imagine if CBC was known throughout the Cotswolds for our love for one another? That being the defining characteristic. This is the love of grace. This is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And real love is birthed as believers are born through embracing the truth of the gospel as we receive his Holy Spirit. Can I encourage you to soak yourself in his word and to let it soak into you like the word of Christ 
dwell in you richly. When Paul was writing to Timothy, he said, you've known from infancy the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ. And in the following verse, he says that these God-breathed Scriptures are useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training and for building us up, for building us up and equipping us to do the good works that God's got for us. So rooted in truth, cleansed through truth, let that old man die. He says, get rid of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Get rid of it. It, has, it doesn't belong. You've got a new heart and a new start. And God will give you those desires for more of Him intensely crave the pure spiritual milk of God's Word, for this milk will cause you to grow into maturity, fully nourished and strong. The comment was the milk is the Lord revealing Himself to us, coming to us in His Word. It's the same when the Lord Jesus in Luke 24 explained on the road to Emmaus all the things concerning Himself. Oh, He comes to us in His Word. This milk will cause you to grow into maturity, fully nourished and strong. Don't misunderstand, we don't worship the Bible, but we receive it as God's breathed Word, and the Lord who gave us new birth by that Word then enables us to grow through it. Get a taste for His Word, like honey on our lips sweeter than honey. I've often wondered with the young people I used to take away to Soul Survivor for 20 years, what's become of them? Are they still going on? Have they fallen back? Are they still growing in their faith? Where are they? And a few months ago, August, I got an email out of the blue, and it said this, Dear John, you probably won't remember me. I was one of the Moncton cohort you took to Soul Survivor. It was almost 20 years ago. You even had to take me to hospital one year after somebody dropped a pot of boiling water in my legs. I remember him well. He says, I once came to you with a question saying I don't have the same experiences as though in the big talk. I don't have the same feelings. And we talked together. And you said that your experiences weren't necessarily those of others either. But you, and this is his words, you patted your Bible, you smiled, and you said that God knew, you knew that God spoke to you every time you opened this word. He said, nearly 20 years later, I've never forgotten what you said. It has shaped me. It's grown me. It's borne much fruit in me. And in my ministry as a pastor in Leipzig, Germany. Do you know? Wow. Christmas for me came early when you know that one of the young people you've taken, he's now a pastor in Leipzig. And this, this story, me telling you, it's not bigging me up. All I did was encourage him to get a hunger for God, a hunger for his word, an openness to his spirit. And he's now acting as a pastor in Leipzig. And he wrote to me following the Christmas service to tell me how he'd get on. And I am delighted. Oh, if we're going to become a loving community, disciples of Jesus, following Him, growing in Him, and making Him known. Let's encourage and affirm one another. Let's grow together. Let's open ourselves to His Spirit. Like newborn babes craves pure, pure spiritual milk. The milk of God's Word for this milk will cause you to grow into maturity, fully nourished and strong. I'm going to finish, but I just wanted to pray. And I'm going to pray two prayers. And if you want to join in, I'll show the second one again. But I don't know how far back in your journey you're starting here. And maybe you're just checking it all out seeing if there's any truth in this. And you've come to a point where you think you know enough to put your hope and faith and trust in Christ. I read a beautiful prayer by R.T. Kendall, and I just want to share that with you. 
And as I say, if you want to pray it, then please do. Lord Jesus Christ, I need you and I want you. I know that I'm a sinner, that I've sinned against you, and I'm sorry for my sins, and I turn from them. Please forgive me and wash me. Wash my sins in the blood of Christ. I welcome your Holy Spirit into my life, and as best as I know how, I give you my life now. Amen. And the second prayer comes from Ephesians 3, just asking God by His Holy Spirit to refresh us and enable us to live this out in a way that's totally honoring to Him. Father, we're asking that out of Your glorious riches, You would strengthen us by Your Spirit in our inner being so that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith, and we pray that we'd be rooted and established in love and that you'd give us the power together with all your holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that we might be filled to all the measure of the fullness of God. Father, would you hear our cries? Would you meet us here? Would you pour out your Spirit in mercy? For Jesus' sake. Amen.